Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Patricia Fortini Brown. I've been a trustee of Save Venice since 2004 and serve on the projects and educational resources committees. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. In more normal times, we would be seeing each other in person at a lecture a venue in New York, but for reasons of which you know, uh, of which you are all too well aware, these are not normal times. So our lecture series has migrated to cyberspace. The upside is that we can reach many more of you. I understand that more than 200 have registered for this presentation. Now, as you all know, Save Venice is involved in a great number of conservation projects in Venice. These include two major campaigns, each costing a million dollars to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the founding of Save Venice. The Italian synagogue in the ghetto, ghetto I'm sorry, and more relevant for today's talk, a major restoration of the Basilica of Santa Maria Assunta at Torcello. More than 2,400 square feet of Byzantine apse mosaics, plus interior and exterior brickwork and stone elements from the divine to the mundane. We might say the divine rests on the foundations of the mundane. Uh, we encourage you to uh, contribute to the Torcello campaign. 90% of the funding has already been raised and we're lacking just $100,000 to put us over the top. Now, why is this relevant to today's talk? The title tells the tale, Venice and Byzantium, icons between empires. We're dealing here with Venice's long engagement with the Byzantine Empire, not with mosaics this time, but with icons. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Emily Spratt as our speaker. Emily was my last PhD advisee at Princeton, where she earned the degree last spring. She is both a Byzantinist and a Venetian specialist, so she's unusually well qualified to speak on this topic. I won't enumerate uh, Emily's accomplishments, which you could read on the announcement of the talk, but perhaps what makes Emily truly special is her groundbreaking research on the use of artificial intelligence in the arts or in the study of the arts. It has already had impact. Her research as a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University's Data Science Institute has already received international recognition. Most recently, the community nominated Spotlight from the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. Please remember that you are invited to submit questions throughout the talk via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll take as many as we can, but um, we may not get to all of them. And now please join me in welcoming Emily Spratt and Venice and Byzantium icons between empires. Well, Pat, thank you so much for such a wonderful and warm uh, uh, welcome and introduction to this lecture. And uh, thank you very much to the Save Venice uh, Foundation for um, inviting me to give this presentation. Again, thank you everyone so much for being here today. From Venice's origins to its demise, Byzantium played a significant role in the Republic's artistic and cultural identity. While the enduring strength of this relationship is apparent in Venice's foundation narratives, civic rituals, and diplomacy. In art and architecture, evidence of the complex cultural exchange between the empires is profound. From the construction of San Marco to the churches designed by Mavro Codusi, modeled after Byzantine precedents in architecture, to the pervasive influence of icons and mosaics on Venetian art and the reappropriation of Byzantine spoilia across mediums, the exchange between the cultures is apparent, yet is defiant of a singular characterization. Indeed, multiple instances of Venice's Byzantine and Byzantinizing influences in art may be observed throughout the Serenissima's history, reflecting different aspects of the empire's interactions even after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire. In this presentation, I will discuss aspects of the visual stamp of this interaction, particularly in icons, and consider how these objects functioned as parts of carefully constructed visual and ceremonial expressions of identity. 
in celebration of the fact that much of the iconic allure of Venice and Byzantium today derives from the visual idioms that were historically developed within the empires, we will take as our starting point the concept of icons between empires to mean less of the modern definition of the term and instead orient toward the words etymology from the ancient Greek, icon, an image or likeness conveyed through a picture. In the medieval and early modern periods, the term icon became closely associated with sacredness in a Christian context, especially in reference to the portrayal of a saint or a holy person as the focal point for veneration and reverence through an image. While the term often connotes a literal interpretation of the term, I'm sorry, excuse me, <laughs> um, a literal interpretation of the term, it also refers to the representation of sacrosanct subjects across a wide variety of mediums from mosaics and wall paintings to ivories, amulets, relief sculptures, and even objects of everyday life. Icons also functioned as agents of faith and identity, and on a fundamental level, the ones presented on wooden boards in particular may also be seen in a purely mercantile context as portable objects that could easily circulate along the Mediterranean trade routes that connected the Venetian and Byzantine worlds. In order to introduce you to the wonderfully complex and visually splendid subject of the Byzantine icons that shared in histories belonging to two of the longest lasting empires in the Mediterranean world, I have divided this lecture into four sections. The first addresses the different functions of icons and how legends about them could be used to bolster their civic status through the example of an icon allegedly seized in Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. We will discuss how this crusade set in motion a series of events which led to major changes in the balance of power in Europe, which ultimately left Venice in an ever increasingly precarious position as the overseer of multiple Eastern Mediterranean territories as the Ottoman Empire was fast expanding. One of Venice's most significant colonies, the island of Crete, will be discussed in section two in regard to an icon that fostered the community's multicultural identity, and in section three, as a place of icon production that was supported by Venice's merchants and trading networks. In the final section of this lecture, I will discuss the reach of icons circulating within the empire through my observations of the appeal of their formal characteristics, even to painters such as Sandro Botticelli in Florence. This last section, which brings us somewhat afield from Venice, yet still connects to the empire, encompasses some of my most recent research on Byzantine influences in Renaissance art. Both in Byzantium and in the Venetian Empire, icons functioned according to their context in public or private settings and in association with both the liturgical calendar and other markers of time, usually related to a miraculous civic or personal event. In this regard, it is essential to understand that these types of images were empowered by the beliefs surrounding them, which frequently diverge from the empirically driven interpretations that we as modern day viewers tend to favor as starting points in our analysis of an historical object. Take, for instance, a familiar icon from Venice, the so-called Virgin Nicopia, which resides in the Basilica of San Marco. Here in this image of the icon, which we can see more clearly without its frame or any revetment, the Virgin and the Christ child are presented frontally and enthroned within the expected gold ground of the icon. This follows a long established iconographic type going back to the reign of Anastasius or Justinian and first appeared as early as the seventh century in icons, although they have not survived to this day. This particular rendition of the Virgin Nicopia, however, was most likely painted in the late 11th century when this somewhat severely executed and schematic manner of presentation was one favored stylistic mode in the, Byz the middle Byzantine art of the Comenian dynasty. Although the subsequent overpainting of the icon makes it difficult to firmly date. 
Despite its excellent condition, given the limited survival of icons from this period, this painting is by no means representative of the outstanding quality of imperial icons that we know were being produced in the capital city of Constantinople. It is in fact a somewhat modestly created work of art that may not have been originally from the capital. Nevertheless, according to Venetian narratives that developed notably after the icon's import to Venice, the legend surrounding the Virgin Nicopia tied its origins to Jerusalem and the time of Christ and purported that its prototype was compared, was completed by none other than Saint Luke, who was believed to have painted the portrait of the Virgin, here imagined by El Greco. In addition, the holy object's translation to Constantinople was explained by the intervention of the Byzantine Empress Evdohia, who was claimed to have installed the icon in the monastery of the Hodegi. Indeed, fabricated and hopeful histories such as this one demonstrate the impetus to establish a continuous narrative around a sacred object, as this helped to justify both the authenticity and hallowed nature of an icon in much the same way that relics were interpreted to establish their associated cults. As Deborah Wahlberg has underscored in her research, the most notable embellishments to the Virgin Nicopia's constructed history did not emerge until 1559, including the icon's famous accolade that it was the imperial palladium or protective standard of the Byzantine army in the Fourth Crusade and had been successfully captured during the takeover of Constantinople. According to Giovanni Battista Ramusio, in his account of the famous voyages, one finds the first description of the icon's capture, which he based on Gottfried de Villardouin's eyewitness account of the fall of the capital. According to Ramusio, the barons and the Venetians battered the walls and towers day and night without end with various machines and redoubled the war, conducting many great skirmishes. It was in one of these that they valorously acquired the imperial standard of the tyrant, but with much greater joy, a panel on which was painted the image of Our Lady, which the Greek emperors had continuously carried in their exploits since all their hopes for the health and salvation of the empire rested in it. The Venetians held this image dear above all the other riches and jewels that they took, and today it is venerated with great reverence and devotion here in the church of San Marco, and it is the one that is carried in procession during times of war and plague, and to pray for rain and good weather. On account of the icon's obvious Byzantine provenance and the development of legends regarding its perceived origins, this image was well poised to become the most venerated holy object associated with the many spoils brought back to the lagoon after the sack of the capital and throughout the course of the Latin dominion in Constantinople. Even though other icons with more obvious imperial origins, such as the exquisite cloisonné enamel icon of St. Michael, also were brought back to Venice from Byzantium as loot from the crusade. It is the myths associated with the Virgin Nicopia, inspired by its iconography, bearing an imperial association with military success through its epithet Nicopia, the Greek for maker of victory, which could inspire its holy and civic elevation in Venice. Indeed, the later edition of the stunningly bejeweled frame is a reflection of the heightened adoration that the icon inspired. In the Byzantine Empire, the epithet for the iconographic type, however, was acquired in the 11th century. Although the Virgin Nicopia in Venice has been asserted to be the original example of its type, its iconography actually differs from other models as Christ is not enclosed in a medallion and the icon is not inscribed as being the mother of God, the victory maker. Compare for instance, the 10th or 11th century enamel terracotta plate in the Louvre of the type which delineates Christ in the medallion. This is just visible in the bottom section of the plaque. 
As Sofia as Calopisi Verci has pointed out, the Venice icon without the medallion is more often associated with the Kiriotisa type in reference to the monastery of Takiru in Constantinople, where it is known that such a representation was housed. This iconographic type relates to the presentation of the Virgin and Child enthroned in the famous apse mosaic in Hagia Sophia, where the Virgin's right hand touches the shoulder of Christ and her left hand provides him support. Sadly, these mosaics are now subject to curtaining, which hinders their study. In the context of Byzantium, even the slightest iconographic alterations could engender significant theological differences in interpretation, especially in regard to Christological interpretations of the divinity of the Virgin, the Holy Spirit, and especially the subject of the Incarnation. For example, in the East, the Virgin, when referred to as Theotokos, or God-bearer, the theological debates surrounding Mary's birth to the divine Christ without being a god herself are invoked. In iconography, gestures as subtle as the touching of figures or their partitioning with medallions or other visual devices reflect the responsiveness of artists to these debates as they were addressed and often readdressed throughout the centuries of the empire. Furthermore, the artists of icons were typically priests or monastics themselves for whom emphasis on theological distinctions was paramount. Indeed, I often think of Byzantine iconography as visual exegesis. Returning to Venice, we know that this particular icon of the Virgin Nicopia did not arrive in the lagoon until after the 1231 fire in the treasury of San Marco. This still places the arrival of the icon within the period of the Latin dominion of Constantinople, the feudal crusader state that was installed after the capital sack and lasted until 1261 and left Byzantium irreparable and economically devastated. By the 1230s, Byzantium was in fact so impoverished that one of the only viable forms of trade was the sale of precious relics back to the West. And it is in with this larger context of desperate plundering of holy treasures to keep the state running that we can interpret the movement of the icon to Venice. Even though the icon arrived in the lagoon during the crusader period, Recent scholarship has clarified that the promotion of the icon and its cult status to the degree to which it is known today relate to the installation of the icon into the altar in the north transept of San Marco from the sacristy in 1618, when the icon was avowed by the doge, the head of the Venetian church, and the entire signoria as the palladium of the Republic. While this declaration may be considered a reaction to contemporary events in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, it was the, con the connection of this icon to Byzantium and its ability to accrue um, such a significant sur narrative surrounding its origins that propelled its political promotion. Although not much is known about the icon in Venice leading up to its early 17th century installment in the altar, between the period of its capture to its official promotion, everything relating to the balance of powers in Europe and the Mediterranean changed. Indeed, it is one of history's greatest misfortunes that the very crusade which had led to Venice's possession of the Virgin Nicopia had weakened the Byzantine state so significantly that the empire's ultimate downfall to the Ottomans and the seizure of the capital in 1453 was only inevitable. For Venice, the loss of Byzantium had meant the loss of not only a Christian ally in the East, but the loss of a territorial buffer to a most formidable foe, the Ottomans. By the turn of the 17th century, with many former Byzantine marine maritime territories under Venetian control, it was the lingering politics surrounding the coalition of the European powers, including the papacy, known as the Holy League, which had fought the continued Ottoman encroachment into Europe that set much of the political stage. 
In this context, Venice was largely left on her own to fend for the territories that ensured her economic success through trade, especially after the Holy League's victory at Lepanto in 1571, which had given a false sense of security against the ongoing threat. In relation to this event, both the promotion of the Madonna of Loreto and the fallout of the papal interdict left Venice in a need of a holy image and cult campaign to foster its agenda against the Ottomans, which could be both unrestrained by papal authority and assertive of Venice's own interests. By consequence, the Virgin Nicopia was well poised to be reimagined to symbolize Venice's divinely sanctioned right to bring about victory in defense of her threatened maritime holdings. One of Venice's most important territorial gains from the crusade was the previously Byzantine held island of Crete, which was called the Regno di Candia. Another icon from the middle Byzantine period, either from the 12th or 13th century called the Virgin Mesopenditisa or the Madonna of St. Titus held particular significance in this colonial environment and may therefore be compared with the Virgin Nicopia in regard to its civic function. This icon believed to have miracle working powers was arguably the most venerated object on the island and was kept in the cathedral of St. Titus. Although the original icon has been repainted, its iconographic type remains unaltered. The Virgin is presented holding and pointing toward the Christ child as the path for the faithful to follow. Indeed, this is the Virgin Hodigetria, literally the Greek for the leading of the way. Like the famously celebrated Hodigetria icon in Constantinople and the icon of the Virgin Nicopia, the Mesopenditisa was claimed to have been painted by Saint Luke himself. As Maria Giorgiopoulou underscored in her groundbreaking research on Crete, during the Venetian period, the legend surrounding the Virgin Mesopenditisa's rise in civic importance in a colonial environment were built on its use by the Orthodox Christians from the Byzantine period. While icons were not regularly incorporated into the liturgical practices of Venice as they were in Byzantium and are in the Orthodox Church, the icon of the Virgin Mesopenditisa was quickly brought into Venetian ecclesiastical practices in Crete. We know from Venetian sources that an early legend associated with the icon purported that it was taken to the island during the anti-religious image period of iconoclasm, which could attest both to its venerably ancient and constant, uh, Constantinopolitan origins. Again, like the icon of the Virgin Nicopia, we may observe that the actual dating of the object differs from its constructed history. Yet it was precisely such a narrative that could strengthen the power and legitimacy of the Virgin Mesopenditisa to operate as an agent of social cohesion in a culturally mixed environment. Although Crete was predominantly Christian, the former Byzantines were for the most part Orthodox and their Venetian overlords were Catholic. In addition to disputes that had to do with the feudal oversight of the island, it is hardly surprising that friction between the populations was not an infrequent occurrence. One such disruption to the peace occurred in 1264, as we know from the account by the chronicler Antonio Trivan, who described the intermediary role that the Virgin Mesopenditisa played in a procession involving both religious groups upon the celebration of the treaty marking the peace between them. He writes, a sincere and honorable peace and obedience to the most serene Republic of Venice were sworn in front of the icon of the glorious Virgin Mary, which in Greek is called Mesopenditisa, that is mediator of peace between the two parties. And as a token of this, the sacred icon was carried in procession throughout the city followed by all the people of both rites, Greeks and Latins, monks and laity, blessing and thanking divine providence for inspiring this heavenly peace. 
Although it has been pointed out that the mediator of peace is not the meaning of the Greek word mesopanditisa, which is likely a toponym, the peacemaking sentiment of the icon is made clear in this account. By 1368, we know that the icon was processed weekly on Tuesdays from the Cathedral of St. Titus to both the Greek and Latin churches in honor of the Virgin and in liturgical commemoration of Venice's protection of the island. Even though this ceremony had a unique Phoenician stamp upon it, ritual components of it have also been related to the Tuesday litany of the Hodigetria in Constantinople, which is known to have occurred from at least the 11th century. According to Giorgio Pulu, by the mid 14th century, the procession required the participation of both the Latin and Greek clergy. Nevertheless, their inclusion in the litany as a sign of the goodwill of the authorities should not be taken for granted as the Greek clergy was often unwilling to participate. This is not surprising since the litany included acclamations to the Duke and the Venetian Republic and its bearers had to accept the authority of the Pope and the wishes of the protopapas, a title indicating the Greek archbishop without giving authority to the office, who was elected by the Latin archbishop. Indeed, by 1515, a lack of participation in this procession could result in a monetary fine. And this is practical and quite a Venetian approach to solving the problem at hand um, for, and was for the most part effective. We can get a sense of this procession from the detailed illustration by Giorgios Klanzas in the Marciana Codex, which has been hypothesized to contain a depiction of the Virgin Mesopanditisa in the Baldekin-like structure supported on poles in the upper row of the drawing. Given the importance of this icon in symbolizing the bringing together of the religious communities on the island, we can assume it was housed in a most esteemed location within the Church of St. Titus. Indeed, the icon was so important to Venice's unique colonial identity in Crete that when the island fell to the Ottomans in 1669 after a grueling 21 year siege, it was brought to Venice along with other sacred objects and installed on the high altar of the then recently consecrated church of Santa Maria della Salute, where you may have in fact seen it. Indeed, this is where the icon resides to this day and continues to be celebrated yet without pronounced emphasis on the facilitation of Orthodox and Catholic relationships. Again, like the icon of the Virgin Nicopia, we may observe significant narrative embellishments to the icon of the Virgin Mesopanditisa's history that allowed the object to be promoted in service of a carefully constructed Venetian identity that underwent notable changes in the 17th century on account of the Ottoman threat to the empire. So far, we have considered the role of two middle Byzantine icons that from a purely stylistic point of view are relatively average icons, yet it is their inestimably high value as miracle working cult objects that make them Venice's most significant icons from Byzantium in the late medieval and early modern periods. At the same time that these icons were lending to Venice's civic and colonial identity, icons continued to be produced even after Byzantium's final collapse as a political entity. As I have discussed elsewhere, it is useful to refer to these objects as post-Byzantine icons. Although no title is perfect, this term conveys that these icons stem from late Byzantine art traditions and were produced in a stylistically flexible, flexible manner while also upholding the tenets of orthodoxy in their representation of sacred subjects. In Venice's overseas territories, post-Byzantine art flourished and the island of Crete, especially before the loss of the island to the Ottomans, was one major center of production. This is significant because most considerations of Byzantine art from a Renaissance perspective conjure images of icons from the empire, such as the ones we have examined, and rarely take into account the fact that Byzantine icons never stop being produced. This is a continuous tradition that goes on even to this day. 
Unfortunately, post-Byzantine icons are often confusingly labeled as Byzantine icons in museums, misleading viewers into thinking they are pre-1453 works of art. So be on the lookout for this when the museums do reopen. Icons continue to be made anew throughout the early modern period in Venice's Greek speaking territories and within the lagoon. They fulfilled the demand for devotional images for private use, the need for icons in Orthodox churches, and also could be specifically commissioned for a variety of purposes, including matters of state. The image on the left here is a small devotional icon, and the one on the right is an icon related to a Venetian official's administrative posting on Crete. Post-Byzantine icons were also unproblematically produced for Catholic clients and worshipers who were well-practiced in the synchronistic aspects of Eastern and Western Christianity that existed in the colonies. Just one example of this is the incorporation of the Catholic Saint Francis into the celebration of Orthodox Saints in Crete. The icon Noli Me Tangere by the innovative iconographer Michael Damaskinos is representative of the persistence of earlier visual idioms from Byzantine art transformed into a post-Byzantine icon through its incorporation of Western styles and subjects. Produced in the late 16th century, this painting is a prime example of the cross-cultural influences characteristic of post-Byzantine painting in Crete, which could accommodate both Orthodox and Catholic patrons. Icons such as this were circulated both within the lands of the former empire and outside it, predominantly in the Italian peninsula, although they reached Northern Europe as well. The subject of this icon, the miraculous appearance of Christ to Mary Magdalene, is taken from John 20, 11 to 17, which is celebrated in the Catholic but not the Orthodox Church. This scene is therefore somewhat unexpected in an icon. It demonstrates what some scholars have called hybrid features, which are hallmark signs of the icons produced in Venice's overseas territories. Indeed, Damaskinos was producing Catholic-oriented icons alongside more pro-Orthodox themes, such as in his icon of the divine Orthodox liturgy or his development of the iconography of the allegory of the Holy Communion, which emphasized the leavened bread of the Eucharist in the Orthodox ritual. In Nulli Me Tangere, the physiognomic representation of Christ in the painting recalls the art of Andreas Rizzos, the mid 15th century painter from Crete. The portrayal of Mary Magdalene, however, derives from late Gothic models, such as those developed by the mid 14th century Florentine painter, Don Silvestro de Gerarducci. In the icon, Damaskinos brings attention to the delicate, well-modeled physiognomic representations of the figures in the manner of Andreas Rizzos, as it is particularly evident in both of the artists' portrayal of Christ. The predominant scene of the icon, however, is based upon the same compositional strategy employed by the Florentine artist. Additionally, the poses of the figures in the background, which relate to the episodes surrounding the resurrection, have been linked to Venetian painting of the 16th century and the depiction of the Mary Magdalene running to the sepulcher, which is guarded by angels, is that of a figura serpentinata, thus suggesting mannerist influences by way of her twisting body. Despite the incorporation of Renaissance models, the gold background and the use of cave tombs in the landscape typical of Byzantine icon painting are maintained. Although not to the detriment of a convincing recession of space in the work, which is unexpected given its gold ground setting. All of these features characterize the mixing of styles and even subject matter in post Byzantine art. While this harmonious mixture of Eastern and Western styles and subjects does exist in much of the art produced in Crete, defining all of post-Byzantine art according to the models that developed in the Venetian colonies is misleading. Icons such as this one have been praised for their Westernizing elements and Renaissance features, while the Byzantine visual idioms are often dismissed as retrograde. 
Another takeaway, one that I would endorse, is that these objects reveal their maker's remarkable spirit for reinvention. In addition, these icons demonstrate a formulaic approach to iconography alongside a general openness to the influence of different painting styles. While it is important to note that Damaskinos was an exceptional innovator in iconography, it is telling that his icons were widely copied and emulated. In this section, we have discussed some aspects of the role of style in, in interpreting Byzantine and post-Byzantine icons as it developed in the Venetian colonies. In the final section, I will share some of my recent research on a painting by a Florentine artist that you may have read about in the news in order to consider the reach of the Venetian trade in icons and the continued yet ever unexpected formal influences that we find in these objects that not only physically crossed empires but shared in their cultural worlds along the way. Just last week, the portrait of a young man holding a roundel attributed to Sandro Botticelli was sold in Sotheby's Old Master's Evening Sale. Dated to the 1480s, this painting stands out within the corpus of Florentine portraiture, mainly on account of its incorporation of a small, separately painted panel depicting a saint that has been connected to the art of the Trecento Sienese painter Bartolomeo Bulgarini. Rendered in a style emulative of late Byzantine art, this painting within a painting appears like an icon and is presented to the viewer in a molded tondo frame that is delicately supported and tilted slightly upwards by the right hand of the unidentified sitter. While the integration of different media in panel painting is not common artistic practice, the insertion of a painting into a Renaissance portrait is quite exceptional. Consequently, the icon-like roundel has been the source of art historical contention, affecting the overall evaluation of the portrait. Building upon the increasing scholarly consensus that the inlaid painting is original, the interpretation of the roundel as an integral part of the portrait requires further consideration of its striking Byzantine qualities, despite its identifiable Italian origins. The young man holding the roundel is placed before a window opening to a clear sky, and there are few environmental features to distract from the sitter and the saint. The subdued slate tones of the interior, which harmoniously anchor the dark doublet adorned sitter in space, also appeal to modern sensibilities for a realism that borders on abstraction and a preference for seeming simplicity and refinement over excessive ornamentation. Attention is thus brought to the naturally illuminated face of the young man in juxtaposition to the gold glowing image of the spiritually illuminated and schematically rendered saint. Presenting the roundel as an object worthy of visual distinction and with added illusionism to appear a separate cherished object, Botticelli may also be portraying the young man as a collector. The, the question, um, excuse me, the question therefore arises as to whether it is the actual painting in the roundel and the representation of the particular saint displayed that has been reappropriated into the portrait for commemorative purposes, or if it is a reference to objects visually similar to it, namely devotional images in the Byzantine style and Byzantine and post-Byzantine icons contemporarily referred to as Tavola la Greca or Tavola Greca. Given Botticelli's patronage by the Medici and that the young man depicted in the portrait is speculated to be a family member, could the inlaid painting be meant to invoke their collection of art and artifacts, including icons? And could this have supplemented the portrait's overall commemorative function? The Medici had indeed accrued at least 12 icons by the time of Lorenzo the Magnificent's death in 1492, and at least one was a contemporary production from Crete, and others may have been too. Indeed, princes, statesmen, and scholars all sought to collect icons, and their identification as objects of antiquity, even when they were not, as we have already seen, lent to their prestige. Throughout the early modern period in Venice, Florence, 
and in the West, more broadly speaking, icons were coveted objects both to collect and to venerate on account of their Eastern origins, which made them seem closely connected to the Holy Land and thus enhance their perceived historicity. As we have discussed, stories were also consciously constructed about icons to lend to their interpretation as Eastern originals. It is in this context that icons were produced, especially in Crete, to fulfill their growing demand. And it was Venetian agents who often facilitated their acquisition and dissemination to not only distinguish men of state, but also into households in want of a devotional image with seemingly identifiable Eastern origins by way of its appearance alone. Within the antiquarian landscape, these newly created originals, such as the later, the later produced icons by Damaskinos, cannot be interpreted entirely separately from their historical predecessors, such as the Middle Byzantine icons now in Venice. Icons were generally viewed less categorically than we might designate them today. From the late 15th through the 17th century, trade in these objects was flourishing and the Venetian maritime routes that connected the Italian peninsula to major centers of icon production, including Crete, allowed for their wide circulation even to Florence. In the aftermath of the fall of Constantinople, there were simultaneously an influx of artists and scholars from the former Byzantine lands. In conjunction with the cultural imprint left by the presence of the Byzantine imperial retinue at the Council of Ferrara Florence, the ongoing Byzantine influence on art and culture in the Italian peninsula is notable. In this regard, it was not solely a, significant, a signifier of the esteemed traditions of antiquity, as this interpretation dismisses the complexity of the contemporary dimension of these cultural engagements and the value of these objects firstly as icons, deeply revered sacred objects that were continuously being produced and were responsive to stylistic trends within Renaissance art. It is therefore not surprising that the Byzantine aspects of the Trecento painting within the late 15th century Botticelli portrait have largely been ignored on account of its tondo shape, which is a rare format in icons. Although the circular delineation of portraits is well known from antiquity and the shared Greco-Roman influence of this form is found in Byzantine and Italian Renaissance art. It was in the context of the uninterrupted cultural interactions between the Venetians and former Byzantine residents in Crete that the Tondo format was applied to portable wooden panel icons by the painter Angelos Acotantos, who was operative in the first half of the 15th century. He adopted the use of the Tondo form in the second quarter of the 15th century when the market for devotional images was burgeoning and icons in Crete could be ordered according to buyer specifications in the Italian Maniera Latina or Byzantine Maniera Greca style. Although the use of this designation in records of icon orders has been interpreted as a reference to the painting style of the devotional images, it is also indicative of the overall flexibility of icons to accommodate Western preferences for their consumption, as we have seen in the icons of the following century by Damaskinos. In this vein, Angelos experimented with different saints presented in the round format, perhaps as an intentional invocation of the Miniera Latina visual idiom by way of its reference to Italian Renaissance Tondo paintings. Given that it was the iconographic type of Saints Peter and Paul embracing associated with the pro-unionist debates that had been promoted in Florence and Ferrara, that was replicated after Angelos's death in 1450 and into the 16th century, the use of the Tondo frame for this subject suggests its intentional appropriation from Italian Renaissance models rather than Byzantine derivatives. Even though it is not possible to determine whether any of the icons in the Medici collection had a Tondo format, it is notable that in the 1492 inventory, um, uh, is described a mixed media icon featuring Saints Peter and Paul standing beside a mosaic of Christ. Indeed, the Medici collection of icons was not limited to painted wooden panels and miniature mosaic icons were especially favored by Italian collectors. 
While mosaic icons were produced in the Tondo format, only one example, a depiction of St. George slaying the dragon from the early 14th century survives. In consideration of this larger context, Botticelli's display of an icon in a Tondo format and incorporated into a different medium resonates with both Byzantine and Renaissance modes of visual presentation. In the portrait of a young man holding a roundel, technical analysis of the inlaid painting, however, indicates that it was originally part of a larger rectangular panel that was cut to accommodate the circular presentation for the portrait. This is most evident in the manner in which the vertical punch work has been interrupted, which makes clear that the inlaid painting does not itself derive from a Tondo icon. Yet given that icons in circulation in the, 15th, in the 15th century, this adaptation is not entirely surprising. Furthermore, the reformatting is likely to have been the result of the conceptual flexibility around the visual presentation of Eastern and Western devotional images during this period in Florence. Indeed, the act of cutting the wooden board is well in line with contemporary approaches to the reframing of disassembled altarpieces according to the latest tastes. Icons not excluded from such visual reformulations were equally amenable to alterations on the most basic level of form. In this regard, overlapping stylistic idioms in Byzantine, medieval, and Renaissance art, such as the Tondo form, seamlessly coordinate on account of their shared roots in earlier artistic traditions, even if they are out of bounds of their separate historical developments and unique expressions of stylistically retrograde influences. Although Botticelli's roundel appears like a Byzantine Tondo icon, both the stippling technique used on the panel and the natural physiognomic characteristics of the saint represented may be firmly associated with Bartolomeo Bulgarini and his workshop. Moreover, the style of the punchwork in particular is not found in icons of the period, although this stippling technique would be copied in later post-Byzantine icons. The iconography, however, is distinctly Byzantine and may have had a particular appeal to Botticelli on account of both the contemporary interests in icons within the Medici's family's collection and the appeal for Byzantinizing Trecento devotional images. For Bulgarini and his workshop, the saint portrayed in the small panel was likely to have been inspired by Saint John the Theologian as he was portrayed in the East in Byzantine art not as the young evangelist more familiar in the West, but as the balding elder with a bifurcated beard appearing with the stamp of years of his writing labors apparent in his shoulders, which seemed to engulf his neck. If the holy person represented is St. John, it is also feasible that the display of the writing implements traditionally depicted with the writer of the gospel was cut off at the time of the paintings resizing into the especially small Tondo format in order to accommodate the dimensions of the overall portrait. One strong indication that these attributes were present in the now missing lower section of the painting is that the saint's right hand appears raised in a gesture that in Byzantine iconography signals a beholder's attention to the words contained within a text through this specific gesture of blessing. Without the presence of an accompanying book or scroll, the portrayal of this particular mannerism therefore seems incomplete. Overall, the gold ground of the panel, the late Byzantine stylistic features evident in the modeling of the saint's face, which evoked examples from Paleologan art, and the iconography point to the artist's emulation of a Byzantine model. Together, they raise the question of whether it was precisely these qualities of the painting that led to Botticelli's selection of it, and if the saint portrayed is in fact the patron saint of the sitter. In the Renaissance, Byzantine or Byzantinizing objects would have carried a perceived sense of authenticity that made them worthy of collection, display, and profound veneration. In the same vein, devotional images of this type were subject to visual reformulation and reimagining according to the latest fashions. 
In the case of the portrait of a young man holding a roundel, the reshaping of the inlaid painting may reflect the spirit for medieval and Byzantine reinvention and a reference to the value of icon collections. It may also convey the association of the sitter with his patron saint. If so, the unconventional visual format of the portrait with its inlaid, um, with its inlaid painting has the effect of appearing more commemorative than reverential in its function, while also drawing the attention of the viewer to the objecthood of the roundel. In this regard, a portrait that has infrequently been examined outside of its Western context may well hint at the complex and underlying influences of East-West cultural exchanges and the subtle yet continued appeal of Byzantine emulations refashioned and reappropriated in the decades following the collapse of the empire. At the core of this exchange, Venice's complex and ever-changing relationship with Byzantium and its cultural aftermath had much to do with larger Renaissance imaginings of the empire. Icons from the empire and the ones made after its demise certainly played a role in this formulation and functioned as agents of faith, identity, and commerce in worlds beyond Venice and Byzantium. When we think of the legacy of icons and modern interpretations of what an iconic portrayal of something is, we are wise to remember that it is the narratives we build around an image that have the most power to propel its promotion. The story of icons between empires past and present is one of both continuity and reinvention. I thank you very much for your attention today. And we thank you, Emily, for a brilliant talk. Uh, I should say that I received a text message from a board member saying during, during your lecture saying, Emily is terrific, and I have to agree. <laughs> I want to thank you, Emily, again so much. Uh, thank you to our Save Venice members who are in the audience. Uh, and I'd like to remind you all about our recent documentary, A Love Letter to Venice. I believe that it features Jeremy Irons, uh, and it can be watched on the website. Uh, and thank you to the donors to the 50th anniversary campaign. And uh, other, anyone else who's interested in contributing to that, uh, please do feel free to call the office or visit the website if you'd like more information. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, save, stay safe and stay well. And, and I just want to add uh, one thing too. If anyone um, didn't uh, have a chance to get their uh, question addressed, um, feel free to email me and I'll do my best to give you a bibliographic reference or, or do, my, uh, do my best to guide you in the right direction. Thank you again so very much today. Great, thank you.